Thank you very much, Andy, for these wonderful insights uh, that we will build on for this conversation that we're going to have now. So now we're going to have a fireside chat on the global uh, climate education gap, right? Um, and to do so, in addition to Andy here, we have also Aurélien Descamps, from, uh, so co-founder of the Silly Test and also affiliated professor at the Cage uh, Business School in France. And I'm myself, Clementine Robert, from the University of St. Gallen, where I am both a PhD student and also more in the administrative part to embed sustainability across the um, curriculum of that university. And I'm also uh, personally sitting in the advisory um, board of the positive impact rating that you will hear more about tomorrow, uh, and former president of Oikos International, a student network that Prime uh, kindly pushed forward also by working together. Uh, that being said, we have 20 minutes now to talk about um, the fact that we are not doing enough, as um, Ajit uh, Parulekar, I'm sorry if I'm not saying it correctly, um, just mentioned right at the beginning as the op opening um, word. So how can we uh, do more to bridge that climate education gap? That's what we're going to try to concretely uh, look at right now and, and bring some ideas. And I will um, obviously hope that that will trigger some ideas for you, how you can do that in your own context as well in your own universities. Uh, that being said, maybe we can just to make sure we are all on uh, the same page and understand what is this climate education gap that we're talking about in the sense that there is this sustainability uh, education you know, uh, conversation going on. So where is that located? Just briefly, and then we're moving to the concrete stuff. <laughs> so who wants to, to start with that? I've been talking a lot, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I can start. Thank you very much, Andy, and thank you, Clementine. I'm really happy to be here. So about this climate, where does climate education sit? I want to echo what you said uh, and pushing for this systemic approach of climate education. It's a systemic problem and climate is embedded into a systemic sustainability agenda. Uh, so the first thing that I would like to, to emphasize is this needs of approaching climate education with this systemic lens. Climate is part of the nine planetary boundaries that you showed on your slide uh, that regulate Earth systems, but also deeply embedded into social foundation of sustainability and our ability to act, to use leverage to act uh, on climate. Climate comes from socioeconomic systems uh, dr driven by humans and all the strategy of mitigation or adaptation will come from those socioeconomic systems. So really, I want to emphasize the need to approach it in a systemic way. And what we are advocating for uh, at Sully Test especially is the need to have a common ground. Uh, of course, sustainability is embedded in context. Uh, we have specific expertise and you will not approach sustainability the same way. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that uh, and to use that, but we need a common ground. We need a common base, a common language, so that a manager speaks the same language as an engineer or a physicist when it comes to sustainability. So building this common ground is the first step uh, for me to really strengthen this climate education. And from this, we can go to context specifics, expertise specific, things and developing specific skills, especially for, for business schools. And, and if I could just add something, the, the framing of it as a climate gap almost makes it sound like, here's education, here's climate, and we just got to bridge the gap. And it's, it's not that simple. We could talk about systems within the educational pedagogy, but we also have to think about how do you change a system? It's an institutional problem. And so there, there's no one answer. There's no silver bullet. How do we change admissions, socialization? How do we change faculty rewards, donors, uh, dean incentives? I can go down the list. There are all these pieces. And from there, it's up to each one of us to decide where's our zone of influence and where are we going to try to have uh, pressure. Um, I recently saw an, uh, an interview with David Suzuki, if you're not familiar, an environmentalist in Canada with a very popular show called uh, The Nature of Things. And he's stepping down from it. And he was asked why, and he said, I see myself now as an elder. 
and it really struck me because I'm starting to think of myself as an elder, as hard as that is to do. But what is an elder? An elder is somebody who's not concerned about their own career. I don't need more citation counts. I don't need a bigger H index. Now I'm going to try and focus on the next generation of scholars, the young people coming in, and the institutions in which they operate. So I am trying to change how we think about engagement and how we think about business education writ large. And so there's my zone of influence. Every one of you has to define it for yourself. There's no single answer to this question. Exactly. I've noticed for the past decade being engaged in transforming curriculum at different levels that young people are demanding for it. Um, elders are trying, because they are free of constraints, they feel that they can really be more innovative and, and think out of the box, create, create new ways of, of doing things, and then it's a bit harder for the ones in the middle. Well, and there's an interesting paradox here because, yes, a full professor can say, I don't care what you think, I'm going to do this. But many senior professors are just stuck in their mode. The young people coming in, I mean, you got to get tenure. You can't change the system if you don't get tenure. But they come in with this energy saying, I don't like the system. I'm going to try and play it a different way. It's an interesting paradox. Uh, I have no simple answer for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so if we think more like how universities and the ecosystem out there, um, how can universities collaborate with each other really to bridge maybe this climate education gap, because it's not one university being alone there. There's, you know, all of us are in there. So how, how can we address that collectively? We are all here also in the room. Um, so how can we take that on? Well, I think competition is a key word also. Uh, we like to teach that we sustainability teachers or sustainability people. And I think for business schools uh, like us, uh, this community, it's important to walk the talk also and to lead by example what we teach for finding collaboration space or cooperation space in a competitive environment. It's true for business also. It's true for academics and for business schools also. So how do we find collaborative or co cooperation space inside a competitive environment? We are competitors, we have to acknowledge that in real life, business school, they are competing, they are in a competitive environment. But how can we define cooperation space within this competitive env environment for stakes that are bigger than us? Uh, collective like Prime, for example, and co community of practice, like the one we had uh, this morning and yesterday around the I-5 project, where educators from different business schools will cooperate, share practices in order to elevate the whole sector into innovative uh, ways of teaching, uh, innovative ways of changing the curricula uh, is, is one example of uh, trying to, to, to integrate this, uh, this collaborative space. Absolutely. I mean, schools are afraid to, to, to stick their head up. You know, the, 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 the tallest nail gets whacked down. And so professors, the schools are afraid to move on their own. So if they move collectively, you know, what Paul Pullman is doing with Imagine is in the corporate sector, but they apply to academia, pre-competitive collaboration. Um, how do we, I would love to get all the deans of the business schools in a room together and say, we're not gonna play by the rankings. We're done. We're gonna focus on innovating and solving the world's issues. If the rankings wanna keep up, we're not gonna follow, we're gonna lead now. That would be wonderful. But also, how many people in this room think that there are competitors in the room with them? <laughs> So we are also, oh, we got one person. Uh, <laughs> we are also part of that place where this kind of collaboration can happen. We share ideas. I mean, I could develop this program, put copyright Andrew Hoffman on it. I see some people do it, it's kind of obnoxious. Uh, but why would I do that? It, it, give it away, open source, that's what we do. Yeah, and we see also more and more collaboration at the program level between universities, providing common programs to students as well. Um, and so there are concrete initiatives that can be, that can be implemented and, and done at different levels to foster that collaboration uh, among the different uh, universities. Not saying that that is easy though, um, because now that we are talking, it looks like, yeah, that's not, that's easy to do. Um, uh, how come it's not more done then? Yeah, that's the big question, the how. Uh, having said that, how do we do that? How do we achieve that? 
Uh, you've said that, and I completely align with it. It's a complex problem. Uh, it's a complex system, higher head. So how do we act on the rules of the system that are driving the system to achieve a shift in that complex system that higher education is? Uh, in other words, how do we find our leverage points? I want to share three levels uh, that we are trying to trigger and activate uh, with what we do uh, at Sulitest. Uh, first, there is uh, the level of the university or the business school itself. Um, at one point, we need to measure what we do. We need to assess the impact of what we do. Uh, we need to measure things in order to pilot transformation. We could we can put more means, we can put more courses, we can put more research agenda. At one point, we need to measure what we do and to be able to report on it uh, and to use it for piloting transformation. Uh, we do that at Sulitest for the knowledge part uh, with a sustainability assessment on knowledge, but it's only a piece in the puzzle. Uh, we need to assess and measure widely uh, through, throughout the whole uh, organization. So it involves ranking and, and uh, accreditation, for example, ranking, ratings, accreditations, standard accreditations that are integrating new ways of assessing, new criteria for measuring, and also uh, new ratings or ranking that are sustainability natives that are able to measure something and to shift, uh, to shift the, the, the system. So the first level is the organization itself and the schools. The second level would be the curriculum, the curriculum designer. One elephant is the, in the room. We keep saying that for today's now is how do we redesign the curriculum? How do we truly embed climate and sustainability in the curriculum and not box ticking, you know, ticking few SDGs and that's it. I can report on my curriculum redesign. So embedding sustainability into the learning objectives, into the very purpose of the curriculum and being able to track it uh, and to, to report on it uh, is, an, um, is an important uh, example. We designed in my previous life as an academic slash sustainability advocate, a self-evaluation grid for professors in the the way they are integrating sustainability into the curriculum. So by design, I know what it is to write your syllabus, you know, and to report on your syllabus uh, as, a, as a professor and an educator. By design, how can I reflect on the way I'm integrating sustainability and expose how can I be accountable of that and report on, the, on this. And the third level, of course, is the classroom. Uh, we need to train the trainer. We need to design training for trainers in order to integrate sustainability, but training the trainer is not enough if we don't engage them. This is where the community of practice uh, really makes sense uh, in order to engage educators because, you know, we are all nice people in this room. We all want to integrate sustainability in our courses, but, but we are not the only one in the faculty. I've been trying to push my fellow colleagues for uh, years now, so I, I also know what it is. Uh, so engaging these other colleagues, these other faculty uh, that are not doing it yet uh, will be key uh, in order to engage this, uh, this train-the-trainer effort. Do you want to build on that university level inside the university? Um, what are the tensions maybe to, to bring that climate uh, education in, in there? Well, when I was listening to you speak, the, 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 the thing that was going through my head, if you want to change behavior within an organization, change the rewards, <laughs> period. And so what are our rewards right now? It, it, it's publications. Uh, teaching, we call teaching a load, our teaching load. It's a burden. It's something that gets in the way of what we're supposed to do. That's seriously problematic if we want people to start to innovate in teaching. So I, w I, would, I would direct the attention to changing the reward system. The rub is one school by itself can change its reward system. A junior faculty member would be crazy to follow it unless they were guaranteed tenure because they need a packet that's saleable on the market. And there's the institutional challenge. You need, you need broad scale shift at the same time. And absent an external threat or crisis, like people just running away from the MBA in droves, which could happen. I don't know, I don't know what's gonna provoke that. Do you have concrete examples maybe on, on some universities or maybe your own trying to do that, like walking the talk, like yeah. we, how? 
you know, the, the, you do your annual report, we all know this, it's research, capital R, teaching, small t, service, barely perceptible S. You avoid that as much as possible, right? Um, we've added a fourth criteria called practice. We didn't say impact. You can have impact within the academic world, you can have impact within the professional world, so how are you impacting practice? Now an important piece here is not everyone has to do it. You know, you can choose how you want to play the game. It's broadening the perspectives on the way you can enact the role of professor. And we've also worked in the SDGs. Tick them off, which ones are you hitting? And that allows you to empirically measure, because we all love numbers, even though a citation count is an awful metric for the impact of an academic paper, yet we live or die by this. Um, but we need numbers, and those are numbers we can use. If I may quickly bounce on, on this, I think for engaging trainers and faculty, the institutional level is really key, is really important. How do we measure success? How do we measure performance? How do we develop careers? As academics, we are trained to be experts in a very narrow expertise, disciplinary based and not fostering multidisciplinarity and focusing on research before uh, teaching. That's for sure and that's powerful leverage. But how do we balance this with also the bottom-up approach that makes sustainability desirable in the classroom for faculty development and for teaching? How it can be a pedagogical innovation, you know, building on reverse pedagogy? I'm an economist by background, so, you know, it was part of your speech and, <laughs> and I'm fully aligned with it. Start, you have to go out of your comfort zone, you know, starting a course by, you know, if we want to address sustainability, we have to rethink economics. I'm an economist, so we will work on that with the, with the students. I think sustainability might be also a way to make it, to make that desirable. You know, it's a change of posture as an educator. You're not an expert anymore because no one is an expert on the whole sustainability scope. But we face the same problem together with students. So this is why, how, sorry, we can unleash some creativity around reverse pedagogy, around co-creating new knowledge with students by being more a facilitator than an expert on that will transfer knowledge. So, of course, we need both. We need in changing the criteria to assess the performance and the, the career of uh, faculty, but we need also to leverage how desirable it is, how innovative and creative it is to integrate sustainability into the classroom, because, you know, at the end of the day, you will have to do it anyway as a, as a faculty. So you can actually enjoy it and uh, bring joy and, uh, and fun in your course by, uh, by, uh, by doing so. And, and just to build on one thing you said, a, a powerful lever is students. Students want this. They really do. They're getting, ve at, at Ross, they're getting very anxious. They're getting very vocal. Uh, one student came into my office and said, I feel like my values are under attack every time I walk into this building. Uh, that's not a healthy thing to do to students, but they're starting to actually say, we want change, and they're pushing for it. And so if you're not seeing in that in your school, scratch the surface. See if it's there. If it's there, try and bring it to the surface, and that can be a powerful lever for change um, to really get things going. Yeah, I would like to just build on this very quickly with, with my experience at the University of St. Gallen is how, um, yes, they are voicing uh, their, their, their demands, and it should not just stay there, is how can we all collaborate between the students, the program managers, the faculty, the staff members, the uh, rectorate, so top management, and maybe also the, uh, the communities where the business school is, so we can transform that curriculum together, because I, I can tell you for a fact, I've talked to professors, senior professors, who are afraid to talk about climate change in the classroom because they know their students know more than they do. So they avoid it. That is not the answer. Bring them in. Try and work on it together. And, they, and now you're going to get a tremendously powerful experience in the classroom, but you're asking a professor, particularly a senior one, to get way outside their comfort zone. So this is a heavy lift. This is yeah, a lot to, to ask. create a co-learning environment somehow, and that's not how faculty was trained before, right? To, to, so there is a shift in mindset that needs to be accompanied by universities. And that's, for example, a position like mine is to take the faculty by the hand and show what are the different possibilities. And according to who you are, you might like one or the other. 
work more with students to review the, the, the slide deck, or work more with, with peers so you can exchange on your challenges and you feel maybe freer to, to, to talk about this or um, get some specific resources because you don't know which resource you can use for your own discipline. So all those elements, I think, needs to be. And I would add one more piece here. The, true, the same is true also when they go out for their internships. I've had many students come back from internships at major, corp major corporations saying they were the expert in the room on climate change. And they're just scratching their heads going, what in the world is going on? But they're not shying away from it. And so this Gen Z is a very interesting generation of becoming very politically active on campus. I've been teaching for 30 years. Campuses were pretty much politically dead until the last two or three years. This generation coming in is really agitating about climate change and equity. It's really exciting to my mind. And that's a way to close the loop, you know. Of course, this is a kind of planet alignment. Uh, we have to rethink pedagogy and we have to change posture being a facilitator. Sustainability is a tremendous opportunity to do that. And we have to rethink curriculum around skills and competencies and closing the loop between higher ed and employability and jobs. You know, those are the skills that we need today and that we will need more and more tomorrow in organization. Uh, so this is the time to rethink the curriculum around those skills that we need for, uh, for future organization. Thank you. I guess now it's time to close. You close the loop. So thanks a lot. And I guess now it's all in your hands to do something at your own level in your own universities, try to collaborate and bring that uh, climate education and sustainability education into your own universities. But I guess we're all here for that. So let's try to make that together as well. Yeah. Thank you.